Swindle, Chapter 5 Ben's eyes very nearly popped out of their sockets. You want to pull a what? Shh, whispered Griffin. It was lunch recess and the playground was crowded. A heist? Like in the movies? A robbery? That's stealing. Not stealing, Griffin amended. Stealing back. There's a big difference. Are the police going to think so? What would the police think about a store owner who rips kids off? Griffin challenged. S. Wendell, Ben said with a sigh, never trust anybody whose name sounds like Swindle. He's the ultimate swindle, Griffin agreed. He sure swindled me, and the only way to get that card back is to take it. What do you say? A hand came down on Ben's shoulder. I say it's time for Mr. Slavic's allergy medication, announced Nurse Savage. Oh, right, Ben exclaimed, startled. The last thing he wanted was for this robbery talk to be overheard by the school nurse. He began to follow her through a maze of whirling jump ropes. Griffin grabbed his friend's wrist. Hey, if your allergies are so bad, he asked in a low voice, why weren't you sneezing from all the mold and dust in the old Rockford house? Ben shrugged. Maybe the medicine really works. Nurse Savage held open the door and Ben disappeared inside the building. What the? Something jag scratched Something jagged scratched Griffin in the back of his neck. He wheeled around to find a sixth grader the size of an NFL linebacker stabbing at him with a long branch. Darren, what are you doing? Griffin shouted. Can't you tell? Darren Vader jeered, poking the stick at the bridge of Griffin's nose. I'm field testing my new invention, the dumb pick. Sorry, I thought your head was a coconut. Angrily, Griffin slapped the branch away. It's a smart pick, you idiot, and it's a miracle of technology. He would never have admitted his own doubts about his father's brainchild to Darren. You wouldn't even know about it if you weren't such a snoop. I wasn't snooping, Darren defended himself. My mom had the paper spread out on the kitchen table. Mrs. Vader was the lawyer who filed the smart pick patent. Yeah, and the and way to blab it all over the school, Griffin accused. Excuse me for making sure a brilliant inventor gets some credit. You guys will be rich someday. You know, when millions of people decide to quit their jobs and start picking fruit. Shut up, Griffin thundered. You've always got so much to say, but when it comes to action, you're nothing. What about the old Rockford house, huh? Where were you on that fr on Friday night? I had the flu, Darren mumbled. You don't look like you're at death's door. It was a 24-hour bug, Darren exclaimed. There was a lot of, of that going around, Griffin chuckled disapprovingly, raising his voice to reach some of the other six readers nearby. Nice show of solidarity, you guys, leaving Ben and me to stand up for the kids in this town. Sorry, Griffin, said Antonia Benson, who went by her climbing nickname, Pitch. My family was at the indoor rock wall. I completely spaced. Me too, admitted Marcus Oliver, totally blanked. Griffin was unconvinced. You guys didn't blink when it came to filling Ben full of stories about railway spikes and possessed pets. There's no such thing as a possessed pet, lectured Savannah Drysdale. Animals are all innocent inside. And speaking of animals, that's why I couldn't be there on Friday. Madame Curie was about to litter. My hamster. And? Pitch prompted. It was a boy, Savannah reported happily, and another boy and three girls. Well, I didn't miss it for any dumb reason like that, said Logan Kellerman haughtily. I have an audition for an acne cream commercial. I had to stay home and rehearse. Rehearse what? Squeezing zits? Darren laughed. That shows what you know about acting. It's all emotion. The audience has to really believe my heartbreak over having a pimple. You are a pimple, Darren grunted. Whatever the reason, we're all sorry, Griffin, Pitch put in. We shouldn't have flaked out on you that way. Maybe some of us were a little scared. Maybe we just didn't think it was worth it. Walking past that big pile of rubble this morning, I wished I'd been there. Our loss. You bet it's your loss, Griffin said resentfully. But with the fruits of that adventure, the Babe Ruth card, 
and they asked Wendell Palomino's chubby hands, he was in no mood to tell them why. Mr. Martinez's students were working on their creative writing assignments when Ben got back to class. He deliberately avoided Griffin's searching eyes as he took the seat next to his friend. Let's get together after school to start working on the plan, Griffin whispered eagerly. Every second he'd spent with the nurse, Ben had been dreading this conversation. Since the days when Griffin's plans had involved bicycles with training wheels, Ben had always been in. It had become as constant as the sunrise. That was what made this so difficult. Griffin, I, I can't. Well, obviously, we'll have to do some surveillance on the store, Griffin went on. You know, pinpoint the weak spots. Ben wasn't even surprised that Griffin had missed his refusal. Once his friend was on a mission, nothing short of an earthquake would get his attention. You're not listening, man. I can't do it. The answer is no. That was the earthquake enough. What are you talking about? Griffin asked. Why not? Ben looked at him helplessly. Where do I start? It's against the law. We'll never get away with it. And it's just plain wrong. It isn't wrong, Griffin said stoutly. What Swindle did, that's wrong. We're just setting it right again. Okay, so it's not wrong, but it's wrong for us. We're not burglars. I know we can talk about how kids can do anything adults can, but not this. Griffin's voice rose in tone and volume. Then Swindle wins! Shh, hissed Mr. Martinez from behind his desk. How can you let that jerk get away with taking advantage of us? Griffin continued in a slightly lower voice. How can you let him get rich doing it? That's my card, my money, our money, because I was going to give you half. I want to be rich, Ben shot back. Okay, maybe I do, but not this way. Boys, quiet, the teacher said warningly. I have to do this, Griffin pleaded. I can't explain, but there's a good reason. All of my plans, this one is the most important. You always say that. Every plan is the most important till the next one comes along. Well, this time it's true, Griffin explained. The money. Griffin and Ben, Mr. Martin has interrupted angrily. Since you can't work quietly as neighbors, you're going to have to move. Ben, you go over and sit with Logan. Griffin, take the empty desk behind Melissa. But Mr. Martinez, Griffin began. Now, as he gathered up his papers, Griffin looked beseechingly at his best friend. His mouth, he mouthed the word, please. Ben could barely muster the strength of will to shake his head no. Griffin's despair was total. Year in, year out, there had always been one constant, one thing that could be relied on through floods and asteroid strikes, the unchanging fact that Ben was willing to follow him anywhere. Yet today, with so much at stake, his loyal friend had let him down, and he had never felt so helpless. Chapter 5, or sorry, 6. Logan Kellerman is an idiot. That was the conclusion Ben had reached after three days of sitting next to the boy. The audition for the acne cream commercial had not gone well, and Logan could think of nothing else. He slumped at his desk. He already long-faced, drawn out to banana-like proportions, blaming his failure on everybody else except himself. The casting director, his parents, and Sanjay Jawani. Who's Sanjay Jawani? asked Ben without an interest. Only the greatest acting coach ever to come out of India, Logan told him. He's giving private lessons in the city. Guess whose parents are too cheap to pay for it? Ben cast a longing gaze across the classroom where Griffin sat behind Melissa Dukakis. That was what really bothered Ben, why he had so little patience for Logan's nonsense. The punishment was over. Mr. Martinez said the two were free to return to their old seats. But Griffin was so upset over Ben refusing to take part in the baseball card robbery that he wouldn't move. I don't sit with traitors, had been Griffin's declaration when Ben had made an attempt to come back. Those were the only words Ben had heard from his best friend in the past three days. The icy silence between them had become so obvious that the other kids were starting to mention it. Pitch kept asking what was wrong, and even Darren commented, Who broke up the doofus patrol? How could Ben ever explain it? 
The same dogged go-getter qualities that forged the man with the plan made Griffin as stubborn as the mule when he was angry about something. Kate Mulholland has been working with Asanjay Jatwani for less than two months, and already she's landed a part in a heartburn commercial. Logan was lamenting. I'm better than Kate Mulholland. I can do heartburn. I can do gastric distress. I can do constipation like nobody's business. At least Griffin wasn't exactly having a picnic on the other side of the room with Melissa. She had a reputation as a computer genius, but it was impossible to be sure that about that. She was the shyest kid in town and spent most of her time hiding behind long, stringy hair that completely covered her face. As Ben watched, Melissa agitated her head into the curtain thinned to reveal pale skin and wide eyes. She mumbled a one-word answer to Griffin's question. With a loud sigh, Logan put his books away and laid his head down on his desk. What's the use? Who can think when my entire career is falling apart? My parents are way too East Coast to understand what it takes to make it in Hollywood. Ben closed his eyes and pictured himself in a faraway place where there was no such thing as a million-dollar baseball card, and heists only happen in action movies. So this was an ex, ex so this was an ex friendship was like Griffin was stuck with a kid who barely opened her mouth and Ben was a stuck with the one who never shut up. As miserable as sixth grade had become, the after school hours were even worse. Ben was used to spending all of his spare time with Griffin, so he wasn't just depressed, he was bored. It's not a toxic combination. He had been biking a lot, almost as if he believed he could outrun his loneliness if he had pedaled hard enough. He must have passed the site of the former Rockford house a dozen times. The debris had been cleared away, all that remained was the stone foundation, and the old-fashioned mailbox out front, a grave marker for the ghosts and murderers that had probably never lived there. The place made him think of Griffin, just like every place that had made him think of Griffin. For Ben, very few landmarks in town didn't hold some special Griffin connection. The school, the town hall, Palomino's Emporium, it wasn't very long before he found himself on Griffin Street, almost as if his bike knew the way and had ridden there on its own. How often in the past had he wheeled up this block, turning onto the familiar driveway? A woman he didn't recognize was on the front lawn, hammering in the stake of a cardboard sign. Ben squinted to read it. For sale. He was never sure exactly how he and the bike separated. The next thing he knew, he was flying through the air. He landed hard on the road, leaving much of the skin of his left elbow on the concrete curb. The sign lady rushed over and helped him. Are you all right? Ben hardly noticed the pain or his bleeding arm. This house isn't for sale. It just listed this morning, she told him. Do you need me to drive you somewhere? Is your mother home? Ben yanked himself away. People live here! The door opened and Griffin peered outside. Ben? Ben pointed to the woman. She's trying to sell your house out from under you. It's okay, Mrs. Brompton, Griffin told her. He's my friend. He hustled Ben inside to the bathroom and held his injured arm under the running water. Calm down, man. She's our real estate agent. Real estate agent? Ben pulled back from the sink, splattering the floor with pink-tinged water. You mean your house really is for sale? You're moving? Griffin nodded. All because I wouldn't do the heist? Of course not. Listen, Ben hadn't told a soul about the Bing family's financial problems. Now Ben listened with rapt attention. That's why I got so freaked out about the whole Babe Ruth card. Griffin concluded the whole sad story. That money would save our house. It would let my dad develop his dream. It would change everything for my family. How can I let a sleazy two-bit con man take all that away? I, I, I don't know what to say, Ben managed. As awful as these past few days had been, it was nothing compared to what Griffin must have been going through. No wonder he was so obsessed with the heist. He was fighting for his home and his family. Despite his horror at the thought of Griffin moving away, Ben was aware of an even stronger emotion. He always wondered what it would be like to be Griffin, to experience the pure, clear sense of purpose that was at the core of his friend's character. In that instant, all of his doubts and misgivings about the robbery burned away. 
What was left was a searching certainty that this was not just the right course of action, but the only course of action. You really think we can pull off a heist? Ben asked. The man with the plan grinned. Chapter 7 The Great Baseball Card Heist Plan of Attack 1. Gain access to Swindle's store 2. Locate safe behind sales counter. 3. Burn hole inside of safe using dad's blowtorch. 4. Return home rich. Major obstacles. 1. Padlock gate. 2. 7 foot high fence. 3. Security glass on front door. 4. 3 deadbolts. 5. Burglar alarm. How can we learn the keypad code? 6. The X factor. Anybody who wires display cases and bolts a safe to the floor must have a few surprises up his sleeve. Surveillance report. 1. Store hours, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. 2. Swindle leaves at 5.30 in black Honda Element. 3. Assistant manager Tom Dufrin closes shop at... 6 o'clock on the nose, Griffin hissed, excitedly making a note on his pad. The two boys were hidden inside a large globe cedar directly across 9th Street from Palomino's Emporium. Come on, Griffin, how about a little wiggle room, Ben complained. I've got a prickly branched up my armpit. They watched as Dufferin got into a car parked at the curb. Griffin wrote down the make and model as the assistant manager drove away. The boys emerged from the bush, shaking and stretching cramped limbs. What do you think about the fence? Griffin mused. I think it's a fence around a lock store with a burglar alarm, Ben confirmed. Piece of cake, if you're made of ectoplasm and can walk through walls. Well, just because we haven't figured it out doesn't mean it can't be done, Griffin replied. If you want it bad enough, it'll come to you. They crossed the street and stood before the heavy chain that held the gate shut. Can we climb it? Experimentally, Griffin jammed a toe in the mesh and hoisted himself up. Luther came out of nowhere. The big Doberman launched itself through the air and slammed into the fence opposite Griffin. The shocked boy lost his grip and tumbled into the arms of a terrified Ben. The two of them landed flat on their backs on the sidewalk. The monster clung to the mesh by its powerful teeth, snarling and growling. Griffin hauled Ben upright and they scrambled back across 9th Street to the cover of their bush. Of their bush. Griffin pulled out his notebook and wrote, Animal control? In large letters across the page. Control that guy? Ben squeaked. I'd settle for being not being his lunch. Griffin looked thoughtful. Who knows more about animals than anybody else in town? Chapter 8. Savannah Drisdale. Savannah Drisdale was talking to a rabbit. She whispered softly into a floppy ear as she held the animal on her lap rocking slowly on her frilly purple quilt. Griffin and Ben could not make out what she was saying, but it was obvious that the creature was totally calm in her arms. Mrs. Drisdale cleared her throat. Savannah! Louder. Savannah, your friends are here! She disappeared into the hall. Savannah regarded them dubiously, but she set the rabbit down. It hopped over to an elaborate cage in the corner where it shared a water-feeding tube with a pair of hamsters. I guess you have a lot of pets, Griffin observed. Not pets, Savannah replied pointedly. In this house, we're all equal partners. My mom, my dad, me, my brother, our dog, two cats, four rabbits, seven hamsters, three turtles, parakeet, and an albino chameleon. If it's an albino, then how does it change color, asked Ben. He has to stay white. It's a disability, and his name is Lorenzo, not it. Griffin cleared his throat carefully. That's really cool that you can talk to rabbits. Does it work with other animals that way? We don't talk about the weather, if that's what you mean. Animals are sensitive to the tone of your voice, the vibe you put out. They know who to trust and who not to trust. They may not be able to understand your words, but they know that they're safe with you. It's not a conversation, but you're definitely communicating. Why? Well, we need you to talk to a dog, Ben blurted. Savannah's eye narrow. What dog? Remember what you said about how all animals are innocent inside, Griffin reminded her. Well, there's this guard dog on 9th Street, a Doberman. He's pretty much pure T-Rex. We're talking vicious, nasty, mean. 
Stop right there, Savannah interrupted. A guard dog is only mean because that's how he was trained. If you take a newborn puppy and raise it so that one behavior never ever gets rewarded is aggressive, you're going to wind up with a pretty rough adult dog. Huh, that's Luther, all right, put in Ben. But that doesn't make it the dog's fault, Savannah continued sharply, and it doesn't mean that a little puppy isn't trapped in there somewhere, waiting for a chance to come out. What if the good dog's been trapped so long that it's gone forever? Griffin wondered, laying in on thick to get to Savannah. Then you're just left with 100% bad dog. That's so sad. There's no such thing as 100% bad dog, said Savannah with certainty. You take me to this Doberman. 6.10 p.m. as Tom Dufferin drove away from the Palomino's Emporium, Griffin and Ben emerged from an alley, escorting Savannah to meet her meeting, to meet her meeting with Luther. He's spectacular, she whispered at her first sight of the Doberman, and then choked back a sniffle of emotion. Sorry, she said, catching herself, but what kind of heartless person imprisons an elegant and noble animal behind a fence? The kind who doesn't want his elegant and noble animal eating any pedestrians, Ben suggested dryly. He's kidding, Griffin put in quickly. The guy who stores this is, he runs a simple comic shop like a military base. You should see the inside. Everything's locked away and all arm wired. Griffin's outrage was genuine. Of all the places in town to break into, Palomino's Emporium had to be the most treacherous. Savannah nodded grimly. To him, this beautiful dog is just another keep out sign. We'll see about that. Luther, sweetie, she called in a loving tone. Come and say hello. I'm a friend. The Doberman stopped dead in its yard patrol and regarded her, its gaze oozing anything but friendship. A low rumble seemed to rise from its belly. You're right, she intoned to Griffin. I can feel the resistance. The poor thing has been taught to be hostile and angry. No, you're doing great, Griffin hissed. When it was me, he tried to chew through the gate. She took another step forward. The boys did not accompany her. Luther's ears went up. The growl got louder. I can't look, Bone Ben. Savannah glared at him. You're ruining everything. A living creature has a sophisticated radar that can sense the emotions around him. Your negativity is spooking him. Godzilla couldn't spook that doll. Dog, Ben mumbled, backing away. Savannah unzipped a small duffel bag and produced a hard rubber toy in the form of a pink poodle with vol voluminous fur and a pom-pom tail. Griffin frowned at it. What's that supposed to be? His long-lost brother? <clears throat> Part of the cruelty of a, God's, of a guard dog's training is the way his world becomes all confrontation and conflict, Savannah explained. We have to bring out the playful side of his personality, which has been suppressed for so long. The imagination, the whimsy, the fun. She turned to the Doberman, smiling encouragingly. Here, Luther, I've brought something for you. She gently lobbed the poodle over the fence. It never reached the ground. With a blood-curdling roar, Luther leaped into the air and intercepted the gift with snapping, tearing jaws. The poodle was dismantled in a matter of seconds, and there stood the Doberman, at the center of its scattering of a pink rubber shreds, the scene looked like someone had fed a box of erasers through a jet engine. Wow, Griffin managed to gnaw. Savannah nodded her agreement. What a magnificent animal. Magnificent was not the word Griffin and Ben would have chosen. While Savannah made nightly visits to the store in an attempt to reach Luther's inner puppy, Griffin and Ben turned their attention to Swindle's burglar alarm. For three straight days, they spent the afternoon hours in the Slavic's den, squinting at the plasma TV. Their noses were pressed to the screen as they painstakingly followed the path of a huge finger. I see blue spots in the front of my eyes, Ben complained. You're lucky, Griffin told him. I can barely see it all. Come on, we've almost got it. It had been Griffin's idea to secretly videotape Tom Duffering punching in the alarm code. Then they could work out the numbers from the movement of the assistant manager's hand. Over the past 72 hours, the boys had memorized his every hangnail and skin wrinkle, but the four-digit sequence continued to elude them. Griffin backed up the tape and ran it again. I think the first and last numbers might be one. See? 
the fingers tap at the top left, and the third is probably zero. It's at the very bottom of the pad. That leaves just the second number. It's in line with the one, only a lower down, Ben observed. What's under the one on a keypad? Four or seven. So it's either one four zero one or one seven zero one. If we guess wrong, the alarm will bring every cop in town down on our heads, Ben said nervous and nervously. With a sigh, Griffin paused the tape. So, how's Savannah coming along with Luther? Supervising the evening sessions at the fence had become Ben's job while Griffin crafted the rest of the plan. Terrible, Ben reported. At this rate, we won't have to worry about the alarm. We're both going to be torn to pieces before we get to the door. No better than last time? The barking isn't quite as loud, Ben offered, but that's only because she's feeding it peanut butter treats, and I think its mouth is glued shut. If the gate wasn't there, it would have spit out the treats and eat Savannah. She says she could do it, Griffin insisted. The dog just has to let down its guard and trust her. I feel kind of lousy tricking her into this, Ben admitted. She probably has better ways to spend her nights than kneeling at a fence trying to sweet-talk a ferocious beast. We'll give her a share of the money from Babe Ruth card when we get it, Griffin promised. You sure you boys can see from there, came a voice. Startled, Ben reached for the remote, but it was too late. His father was already in the living room. Mr. Slavic frowned. What's this, some kind of homemade reality TV? Griffin spoke up. It's a project for school. You have to guess the code. He hit the play button on the VCR. We've got it narrowed down to 1401 or 1701. School sure has changed since the days of the three R's, commented Ben's father. I don't have a clue, unless... An odd expression appeared on his face. Is there a chance your teacher might be a Star Trek fan? Griffin perked up. Why? People choose combinations that will be easy for them to remember. On classic Trek from the 1960s, the serial number of the USS Enterprise was NCC-1701. He looked embarrassed. I know, I'm an old nerd. Griffin thought back to the security cases of figurines, models, and toys at Palomino's Emporium. There had been merchandise from dozens of TV shows, movies, and fads of every variety, but 60 Star Trek seemed to be a favorite. Don't worry, Mr. Slavic, Griffin said, unable to keep the triumph out of his voice. I think the guy we're dealing with might be an old nerd, too.